Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, September 30, 2020, COVID update, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Optimal Health Associates. Uh, major good news to report today on the understanding of immune function and protecting yourself from COVID. It's nothing you haven't heard, but the data is changing or evolving. Again, the FDA and CDC will be the last ones to mention it. Fauci will jump off a building before mentioning it since the data is becoming very clear. Uh, but we'll get to that <coughs> zinc. But um, before we do that, let's talk about numbers. More than a thousand cases yesterday in Oklahoma. Uh, the state of Oklahoma, we're over 1,030 deaths. Unfortunately, hospitalizations are continuing to increase. Hosp hospitalization, hospitals are being saturated with just normal patients and COVID patients. So uh, big thank you to all the nurses. Please, if you have any friends who are nurses, tell them thank you for their hard work, whether they're working at a hospital, they're working, sorry, um, uh, in an office, wherever they may be, there's a huge nursing shortage and we need them more, more than ever. And again, a big thank you to all the doctors, other providers, respiratory therapists, clerical staff at these hospitals who are, who are taking care of all these patients because they're going back into the breach as the saying goes. So when we look at what's going on in the immune system in this recent data that came out, we have, first we're gonna define the immune system. We have our innate immune system or our basic stuff, and it's the oldest part of, of an immune system for a mammal. And then you have your adaptive immune system, which is you can make very specific things or antibodies to go and attack stuff. So your innate immune system has white blood cells, it has these proton, or proton, protein mediators, uh, interferon, cytokines, etc. So you get exposed to a virus or a bacteria, you can have some cells, macrophages, neutrophils attack it, and you're gonna release inflammatory mediators to fight it off. Uh, so viruses, same thing, but the key player, and which I have talked about and talked about and talked about for these last eight months, is alpha interferon. It is a type one interferon within the family of interferons. It is the key one of the, I think, for in terms of viral fighting, but in general, it is one, at the very least, one of the key ones. Turns out, in a thousand very, very ill COVID patients, what did 100% of them have? They had deficient low alpha interferon, which is what I've talked about we can't have. They looked at, case controls and other people who didn't get sick or that sick with COVID, they all had normal to high alpha interferon. It is the clearest demonstrable separation between those who get sick and those who don't. Within the group that had lower levels of alpha interferon, 3.7% roughly had made autoantibodies to activate their type one interferons. And normally that's more common in women. In this case, it was those types of autoantibodies, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, thyroiditis, whatever, are more common in women. In this case, it's more common in men. We don't know why. And so that's, that's a problem uh, that we don't know why yet. But the key thing is, if alpha interferon is deficiency, is causing the escalation in illness and inflammation, what do we do about it? Well, the number one mediator, which I've posted several studies, I just posted some more information about it tonight in a written post. On it, Facebook. On Facebook, thank you, Kim, is zinc. It's zinc. I've gone on and on and on about zinc because zinc is toxic to RNA viruses. It is a immune modulator. Plaquenil in part works through being a zinc ionophore or getting zinc from outside the cells to inside the cells. So when a virus gets in there, the zinc can kill it because all RNA viruses have zinc finger proteins. Okay, there's my finger. Okay, we'll do it like this. So you have a band of proteins going up, a band of proteins going down, and in the middle is a zinc. So when zinc interacts with that viral particle the, on the inside, it knocks the zinc off the zinc finger protein the zinc finger protein kind of breaks apart or separates somewhat, it inactivates the virus. That's the mechanism of action. So you have zinc both 
killing and hurting all RNA viruses and in labs, it clearly, clearly, clearly is inhibitory to COVID-19. We've had two clinical trials in the last few weeks showing that patients with high zinc or higher zinc have less sickness, low zinc, more illness. And now we have this data that says it's all about alpha interferon. And the alpha interferon is the second part to make your immune system, immune system function. Older people don't have zinc levels that are adequate, which is why they get sick so much often or sick so much more often. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, it's all about the zinc. It's the zinc, it's the zinc, it's the zinc. The second part of some of these new studies is looking at kids. Kids have more alpha interferon. They have a more brisk response, it turns out, to COVID initially with their innate immune system, which then allows the adaptive immune system to respond appropriately. So the problem with adults is if you have a more sluggish innate immune system, you can have, del so the other thing the innate immune system does is it feeds information to the adaptive immune system. So your B cells and T cells activate, your natural killer cells, and then your B cells make antibodies to attack the virus. What we don't want is this aberrant, weird, just massive inflammatory cascade, or the secondary thing that happens with COVID with, because of the ACE2 receptor where we get an increase in bradykinin, which goes up in, in asthma patients in an active event or an anaphylaxis. So we don't, and you get that, we don't want those things to happen. And so the natural way for that not to happen is to have a potent, nice, innate immune system with a force field, as I've said, in front of you, zinc. And then of course, vitamin D and a multi. And then the melatonin to help balance out the weird interleukins that can elevate. And, and the little kids already have that, so that's why they're not getting sick, and that's why it's okay for schools to be open. If you're terrified at home sitting going, <gasps> I, can't go, I can't let my kids go to school. Yes, you can. <laughs> Think about their well-being. I mean, they need social interactions. They really do. I, get, I mean, every day I have parents in, every single day, concerned about their children, concerned about how they're doing because they're either not in school regularly or they're not in school at all and they're not doing that well. And I hear that every single day. Children need to interact with children. As interesting as we are as adults, we're not that interesting. So that's what I would communicate on that. So great news. It's about the zinc. Get the zinc in your body. And again, I posted it. I'm trying to make it really easy on the zinc. If you're over 150 pounds, you take 50 milligrams of zinc a day with food every day for two months and then just Monday through Friday. If you're pregnant or under 150 pounds, it's 30 milligrams a day for two months with food and then Monday through Friday. If, if you're under 100 pounds, don't do the 30, drop to 15 and you just do 15 every day. If you're under 18, I think 15 milligrams every day is great. If you're under 12 and under 100 pounds, I think 15 milligrams three to five times a week is great. If you're really, if you have a really little child or someone under six, seven, five, Flintstones, they have about 10 in them. And that's the other thing to keep in mind. If you're having any problems with the zinc, just get a Flintstones with zinc. 99% of people can tolerate that. It's very, very tolerable to be redundant. And the recommended daily allowance of zinc is about, you know, 11, I think for, or, eight for women and 11 for men or something like that, I posted it. So that, but that continual usage of zinc is gonna get your alpha interferon. And remember what we've talked about with uh, doing the bolus or, or pulsing it, which is a separate topic if you get infected. But that's what I want people to know. It's all about your immune system. This is a sociologic disease of poor nutrition. That's what it is. Why the FDA won't say that, why the NIH won't say that and is because of reasons I don't understand, which I won't talk about tonight. I do understand it, but I'm not going to discuss it because I already have. <laughs> so what are the questions? Kim has some questions for me tonight from our viewers. Yes, yeah, so that was great. You talked about zinc. There were several on those. Um, I, you've already answered these, but I'm going to ask it again exactly how they asked it. 
Should kids age 12 to 16 supplement at all? Yeah, I would have, yes, I would have kids take 15 milligrams because you don't know what they're eating. And, you know, at this point, it'll make their hair grow even faster. I mean, that's what we have always used zinc for in my practice because we're a gynecology practice and, and wellness and we have women and men who have hair loss and one of the things is zinc deficiency. And you're like, it's crazy, but iodine deficiency and zinc deficiency, both of major immune modulators, um, also cause hair loss when they're low. Should very young kids, this person specifically asked two to, from two to nine, but even a little older than that, do a zinc pulse if you think that they've been exposed? I don't think little kids need to do a zinc pulse. Uh, I just don't, I think their immune systems are so robust and their risk of uh, hospitalization is so low that if they're just doing daily zinc, they're already had a 90% of the kids in the U.S. So their immune responses are going to be just like, bam. So I'm not worried about them at all. Plus they already have high melatonin, they have human growth hormone, they have all this stuff. So unless your child's immune compromised, but I mean formally immune compromised, you've been diagnosed by a pediatric subspecialist, not your normal pediatrician who may have offhandedly said, oh, I think your kid's immune system's a little weak. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you went to a children's hospital somewhere in the United States and saw a subspecialist who said, your child is immune compromised. I don't think you need to do a zinc pulse. Okay. Um, you in your last video you talked about after you've been on zinc for a long you can skip a few days during the week. Mm -hmm. Do you have to? I don't think you have to if you're on 30 milligrams. If you're on 50 milligrams and you weigh between 150 and 200 pounds, I'd probably skip two days. If you're over 200 pounds, 250 pounds, it probably doesn't matter. Your, your ability to get uh, super high levels low and to get copper depleted is really low. But I think in general, I think two days off a week is fine after two two months. And remember, zinc has a small chance of depleting copper at the higher doses. Um, and so nuts, hummus, seafood, vegetables, you have to eat a normal diet. If you're eating fast, crappy food all the time and not taking in nuts and seafood and vegetables, you can get copper deficient. Okay. Um... You talked about zinc toxicity. Yes. Can you explain that and how would you know if you had it? Well, zinc toxicity falls into two, two ranges. Zinc toxicity one is not zinc toxicity, which is what I'm going to talk about. It's zinc side effects. Like if you take iron, it hits your intestinal tract. It can give, make you nauseated because it's an, ir it's an element. It can irritate it. So you can get diarrhea. You can get cramping. You can get constipation. You can get nausea. Zinc is also an element, and it's not a toxicity per se of overdose. It's just a side effect that it can upset your stomach. So it can cause a little bit of nausea. It can cause, um, uh, sorry, vomiting. I was going to say emesis, you know, the silly doctor word, um, and cramping. So that's why you always take iron or, or zinc with food. Iron you want to always take with some acidic things so it absorbs better. Zinc doesn't need that. Um, now, zinc toxicity is when you get too high of a level, which is about over 150 persistently, and probably you're going to have toxicity more at 160, 170, or maybe 200 or 250. Um, that is incredibly rare with the doses of zinc we're talking about. I can't put a number on it. Um, pregnant women are restricted to a max of 40 a day, in theory, from pregnancy. Um, and again, I think that's fine, but it's pretty hard to get zinc toxicity. Um, but it's possible. It's possible. We've had one person notify us via Facebook that their son got um, toxic on zinc. I don't know any of the details and I don't know if it was um, through just taking it once and it made him get all sick or if they actually got elevated levels and then they got more persistent nausea or vomiting or something like that. It's very self-limiting um, and will go away very quickly once you stop the zinc. Okay. Is keeping the immune system on high alert for prolonged time safe? Okay, we're not putting it on high alert. I want to differentiate that. We're not putting the immune system on high alert. We're making it highly functional. That's the difference. We're not over revving the immune system. We're giving it the macronutrients it needs to be highly functional. So just like we say zinc can be used to help hair growth um, when follicles are, have low levels, the zinc increases the blood flow and the overall functionality of the hair bulb. So the hair bulb works better and grows better. So when you take, when your zinc is 
a little lower and you bring it up, your immune system starts to function better. And I posted a paper that goes over all that uh, earlier on Facebook this evening. I just put it on YouTube. Too. Oh, on YouTube too. So again, you're not oh, you're not putting it on a high alert. You're just making it optimal, which is why we're Optimal Health Associates. We want optimal levels. Like that's why we shoot for vitamin D 80 to 100. We know at 80 to 100, you have an optimal level. You had two years to your life. You lower your risk for anxiety and depression, fibromyalgia, muscle aches and pains, and all this stuff. Plus, it's an anti-neoplastic at that level. So that's why we want it at an optimal level. You don't get all those benefits at 60. You get some, you get benefits at 60. I want to be very clear about that for your immune system. But if you want to really hit all the check marks, you go 80 to 100. Okay. Um, if you are going to retest after you've tested positive for COVID, how long should you wait after testing positive? Well, so the current recommendations is you never retest after a positive test because we want the test for people who are symptomatic. And so the bottom line is you can stay positive with residual RNA uh, for three months. So it makes no sense to retest. Retesting is, is silly. The recommendations now that companies or universities are, oh, we have to retest, they're idiotic. They make no sense. They're scientifically invalidated now. Even this, I always use this, if the CDC gets something right, it's a miracle. They have this one right. They do not recommend retesting. What you should do instead is about four to six weeks, do an antibody test. And if it comes back positive, you have antibodies. If it comes back negative, you could still have antibodies, but we may have to wait and retest with a more advanced test later. If you come back with antibodies, you're gonna probably have some partial immunity there, which will get teased out later as more data comes. So you talked again about kids being in school. Um, some of the schools don't require masks. Do you still feel the same way? I have always recommended masks in schools on the odd chance that a child can infect a teacher. That's very, very unlikely but it is possible. And I think when we're trying to go for perfect outcome, which you know you can never reach, or at least excellence in outcome, to quote Dr. Ed Dalton, what's the enemy of excellence? It's perfection, because we can't be perfect. That's a great quote from a Harvard-trained surgeon. Uh, I think ultimately, though, I believe masks are beneficial to the teachers, and they may be beneficial to the other students. So when possible, if over you know four to five years of age, I think it's a great idea. Okay, good night. Take care. Be safe.